Hi, this is Simon Drew, and you're listening to the Walled Garden Podcast. This show belongs to the podcast network of the Walled Garden Philosophical Society, an international community of philosophers and seekers dedicated to the pursuit of truth, wisdom, virtue, and the divine, wherever they may be found. To find out more, go to thewalledgarden.com. But for now... Let's caretake the gardens of our minds, one meaningful conversation at a time. Everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Walled Garden Podcast. So today I wanted to share with you a conversation that we had just last week with Professor William O. Stevens. Now, Professor Stevens is such a profound thinker, philosopher, and uh, what you'll hear today is that there is a, a deep theological tilt in his thinking as well. Uh, he is widely known around Stoic circles as being one of the foremost scholars on Stoicism. And he has a particularly excellent grasp on the theology and cosmology of the Stoic philosophy. And so we wanted to have him back on the show. And this episode actually represents a very important shift in the direction of the Walt Garden Philosophical Society. Because lately we've been toying with this idea that, you know, when we have interviews on the podcast or in our society, uh, we would like to invite our members and listeners to actually join those conversations. And not only to be there listening along as we're having the conversation live, but to engage in that conversation. And so that's what we started doing in this particular uh, event that you're about to listen to today is it was an interview between us and William O. Stevens. Uh, But when I say us, I mean Anybody who's there, anybody who's interested in asking a question. And so uh, this episode features not only Professor Stevens and myself, but uh, also Angie, one of our members in the World Garden, and uh, Judith Stove, who was also in attendance. Uh, They both wanted to ask questions of Professor Stevens. And I think that that overall has led to... uh, Really, this was one of the most profound conversations uh, that I've ever been present for. And uh, I was so grateful that we had this conversation that we got to dive into these particular topics which are so vital in these times uh, as you will hear. And so following on from that, I I do want to encourage you to go and check out the events that we have coming up in the World Garden Philosophical Society over the next few weeks and particularly this next coming week because we have some wonderful conversations coming up. For example, tomorrow, uh, October 18th at 8 a.m. PST, that's California time, we are going to be meeting with Brian Russell, uh, a wonderful theologian, speaker, spiritual coach. Uh, he is a fascinating individual who was actually recommended to me by my sorry by uh, Joshua Bertolotti. But we're going to be discussing prayer and presence. And the format is going to be very similar to the conversation that you will hear today in this episode, because we're going to be encouraging anybody who's in attendance there to be asking questions as well. 
And so if that sounds like a topic that interests you and you'd like to ask some questions of Brian Russell about prayer and presence, uh, please come along and you can ask your questions there. Uh, The other event that we have coming up this week is, of course, our Soul Searching with Seneca Meetup. That's with Judith Stove and myself. And this week we're going to be discussing fame, philosophy and pedigree, diving into two short letters from uh, Seneca's archives. And so if you'd like to attend either of those events this week, just go to thewalledgarden.com forward slash events and you can register there and we would love to have you there. Okay, so I don't want to spend too much more time in this introduction. Uh, If you haven't already heard Professor William O. Stevens on the podcast before, I highly recommend going back and listening to previous conversations with him. He's a fascinating individual and I was just so grateful that we got to have this kind of conversation around these particular topics with uh, this great philosopher. Uh, So without any further ado, I present to you this conversation with Professor William O. Stevens. Stoic cosmology and theology was the kind of theme of today's discussion. And William, it's actually kind of perfect timing because over the past few weeks, we've been having some really profound discussions in in uh, in our society, especially, uh, I would say, uh, Judith and I, we've been doing this soul searching with Seneca series. And uh, last week in particular, we were discussing Seneca's letter on the God within us. And we had this really profound conversation about this idea that... Uh, <laughs> stoic the stoic view of kind of spirit and matter it's not necessarily separate it's kind of like this this uh how, how would you say the the, the the best way that i know how to describe it is um i wrote this poem in, in the poet and the sage where i was exploring this idea of okay so you you do the whole Marcus Aurelius, you know, shoot yourself up into the sky, look at the whole world and how massive this cosmos is, but also how tiny the the little world that we're on is and how tiny we are as a part of this grand cosmos. But then in the poem, I then dive back into my own body and into my own heart and into my organs and then into the smallest, tiniest little parts that make up the body, that make up everything else and realize by the end of this poem, I realize that, oh my gosh, no matter which way you go, either up or down, uh, ultimately you're going to find yourself at the same space, which is that there's there's got to be this substance that makes up everything, uh, which means that essentially the boundaries between, you know, your inner body and your the outer world is, is not so clear. And I wonder if maybe uh, I, I could throw it over to you, maybe just to give us a brief outline of, you know, Firstly, what is cosmology? And maybe could we talk about this this idea that the Stoics give us of, of spirit and matter? What what do they think of spirit and matter? How are they divided or or not? Yeah, <clears throat> that, that's really excellent. And and this this is the the big picture view for the Stoics. But this is where the Stoic system really is very cohesive, and they are quite explicit that the three branches of study, Stoic physics, study of reality, logic, the study of reason and argument and persuasion, and ethics, conduct in life, the good life, all hang together. They're all, they're all different pieces of the same one thing. So this notion of holism is extremely important in Stoicism that, uh, and Marcus is very, uh, is very good at rehearsing this in his meditations, that to understand the whole, you have to understand the parts, the parts fit together to make the whole. And so the example that that you gave, Simon, was an excellent one and one that the Stoics famously use, which is that the universe, the cosmos itself, let's start with a little philology, right? Judith can back me up here, right? Um, uh, uh, cosmos isn't just, you know, the world in some sort of loose sense. The cosmos is a world order. It's an orderly place. The cosmos is ordered. It is thoroughly structured through and through. And so the analogy to a body, to a living organism, an animal, and all of its component organs 
and its bones and blood and tissue, all of those structures, all the way down to the living cells. This is an analogy that the Stoics use to describe the cosmos. And they have an argument for the cosmos being one you know, unimaginably large living organism, right? Because the, the argument, and this is, I won't have this exactly right, but the, the rough reasoning is um, uh, living things are better than dead things. Nothing's better than the cosmos. Therefore, the cosmos is alive. It's very straightforward okay. syllogism. I think I'm following you there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the kind of syllogism they use to make that argument to support the view that the cosmos is one macroscopic living organism composed of myriad, countless smaller living organisms. So just as the cells of our body are alive and collectively constitute us, like the like the red tabby cat there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you're just gonna have to deal with these cats running around. Oh, He's probably I've, gonna come I've got over three here. of my own that are wandering around here as well. That's Beautiful. very well. Uh, but you know, the cells in our body constitute us, um, and we and all the other planets and, and pieces of parts of the universe, which might seem to be separate and disconnected, are in fact deeply and intimately interconnected, composing this whole living cosmos. And so, as you said, you know, the material or the stuff that the cosmos is made of the Stoics did describe in physicalist terms. So this included the soul because all ancient philosophers, virtually all of them did believe that this is what makes any living thing alive is that is, it is ensouled. Mm. And so our souls are physical things, right? And the Stoics described them in terms of uh, this, this pneuma, this, this energy. Um, and energy itself, of course, is a physical thing, right? So to understand spirit as not something separate from, but um, a kind of you know cohesive aspect of understanding how pieces of matter interact with each other, how causation in this causal nexus of the universe and even down to our own bodies, how how our thoughts and our senses and perceptions. Uh, arise from the operation of this physical entity, this ensouled physical entity. So for the, and so th this is gonna strike, this strikes um, many uh, in the Western tradition who are much more familiar with a Christian notion of dualism, stretching back to Plato, where soul and body are distinct. They are different substances. They are very radically different discontinuous types of things that somehow causally interact. That's the puzzle that dualists have to try to explain, and, and it's very difficult for them. Whereas in contrast for Epicureans and Stoics, souls are physical things, and that's precisely what allows them to interact with material bodies. If they weren't physical, then the two couldn't interact causally. So the Stoics mm. say, obviously, the soul would have to be a physical thing. But it's a very special sort of physical thing in contrast to a stone or a tree, right? Um, the Stoics have this theory of tension that the, the pneuma, this breath, this, this uh, kind of breathy, breathy air energy uh, uh, binds together in the form of a stone or a tree or a cat. Um, and depending on the tension, of the pneuma within each of those things, it regulates the kinds of abilities that it has. So the cohesion of the rock is it just as a mineral that just hangs together. But when you have a living tree, obviously it produces, um, it, it, it takes in nutrition, it takes in water, it converts sunlight into energy so that it can grow, it grows and then it reproduces, right? It sheds uh, acorns for the oak tree or uh, seeds or whatnot, which then can become new living things um, because of the kinds of organization or the tension of the pneuma within it. Mm. But all of this is told within a descriptive uh, physicalist kind of scheme, right? Down, down to the smallest of cells.
right, which, which are alive. So mm. uh, that's that's one way to kind of describe what's going on cosmologically. And then at the larger level of, uh, of more complex systems, um, beyond individual human bodies, right? We seem to be separate from each other, but the Stoics understand human relations as also intimately interconnected, right? So they defend the view of this cosmopolis, that there's this city of citizens composed of resident citizens who are all rational beings. So all rational beings, all beings with logos throughout the universe, whether in this on this planet or anywhere else, are members of the same one universal city. And this is their notion of cosmopolitanism. And so again, Marcus is wonderful. And Seneca discusses this too, right? Seneca talks about the two different cities. There's the cosmopolis, there's this universal city that comprises all rational beings everywhere, including the gods. And then there's the local city that your body is thrown into upon birth, right? You're born into a particular locale, a particular city, a particular state, a particular nation, a particular time and space. And so you have, you have dual citizenship, <laughs> right? So do, do you have dual citizenship, Simon? It's, it's funny to note. This is the first conversation I'm having with you stateside. I've recently moved to America. So I'm in California yes. now. So, <laughs> so you're in California now. Yes. I, I've got well, I've got British and Australian citizenship. Now I'm boom, I'll be working on yeah. You're working on the American but, but anyway, go on with the analogy. Very please. good. Right. So yes. Well, welcome. W welcome to California and welcome to the Great United to be States. Here. Delighted yeah. to have you here in North America with us. Um <laughs> for the Stoics, the dual citizenship is this kind of local citizenship. You know, if you're born in Greece or born in, you know, in Athens or Rome or Los Angeles or Chicago or wherever, Wisconsin, you've got that local citizenship. And from that flows duties to your family members, your friends there and your neighbors, right, at local level. So your local community, there are duties that flow from those relationships with those people within those circles of affiliation. But then again, at the cosmic level, your other citizenship is to the universe as a whole, to all rational beings everywhere. Um, and this notion of cosmopolitanism is really very powerful because it means that, you know, as I interpret Stoicism in the modern context, this is what allows us to use our faculty of reason to see beyond trivial superficial differences between nationalities, between and among ethnicities and race and sex and sexual preference and, and religious, uh, religious allegiances, that sort of thing, religious uh, uh, relationships seen beyond those rather superficial differences to the deep commonality, the deep shared interests that we have with one another for living collectively in this living organism, right? In this cosmopolis, this living thing composed of all of us, all rational beings everywhere. Mm. And so it's much easier to then see common interest in the common good from this universal perspective, this cosmic perspective, instead of devolving into a very narrow-sided tribalism where what's emphasized are these really ultimately very superficial differences that are then magnified to generate conflict and division and then of course that that can lead to con that can lead to you know very serious strife and, and conflict and that sort of thing um, and that still cosmopolitanism allows us to transcend that very narrow-sighted that myopic kind of view of superficial differences mm. that that people often fall prey to and that we see in our political discourse and political diatribe always dividing dividing us versus them how how we are different than this group and this group and this group how they're other from us and if they're different then they're strange and if they're strange then they're probably hostile and we should be afraid of them or we should dislike them this is the kind of pernicious political diatribe that 
stoic ethics allows us to neutralize and see beyond yeah. as illusory. I'm very sorry about this cat. <laughs> but seriously, guys, how's that for an introduction to William's mind, right? That answer, profound. There's so much in there. Oh, man, okay. I've got many questions. I'm going to try and start with just one. Let me see if I can synthesize this. So, um, a Angie, did you did you want to ask oh, a yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, jump in, Angie. Yeah, I was, um, you know, I, I studied, well, I went to school to study social work, but in order to to study it, I had to study sociology, and we talked a lot about, um, you know, in um, intersectionality and like, uh, you know, like who you are, like, like if you're male, female, um, what race you're a part of, and stuff. And and although those are very important uh, to remember in history, that there are like injustices from the past, and there still are injustices right now. But once you like sort of it like I'm like Mexican American but I'm but I don't um identify myself like that all the time you know I'm just right. a human being and right. I just happen to be Mexican and American and um and like but sometimes people could get so boggled down to like who they are like their identity tied to them so strongly that they sort of look past the similarities that we all have, especially in the political realm. And I don't know, it's just, um, I don't think we should live in a colorblind society either, but there should be a sort of balance to like, yes, we are, uh, we might look different, we might speak different languages, uh, be from different religions, but we fundamentally want the same things at the end of the day. Yes. And we should sort of connect to that. So I love your discussion on um, on that of the of being dual citizenships. Like you're you're you have a duty to your uh, local community, your family, but you also have a duty to the human race as well. Exactly. And that's absolutely beautiful. Exactly. And and thank you very much. Yes. And that. Uh, it's just, it's a very important idea in Stoic ethics, understanding who we are and what we are, right, as rational beings. And 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 the affinity, it, it, it extends beyond humanity, right, because we also have a relationship to the other non-human animals on the planet, right? I mean, S Simon and I have, you know, relationships to our cats, these are our these are our you know four legged furry companions right they're members of the family they're not just they're not just some you know random creature that happens to in, inhabit our home so you know we we have reciprocal relationships with them they are affectionate to us we take care of them trim their claws and and feed them and make sure they have clean water and we take them to the vet in a kind of nurturing relationship with those non human animals so that even if they're not rational the way that we are, we have duties to them as our companion animals. As you were saying, you know, your, 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 your gender is part of who you are, but some philosophers argue it's not even the most important part. It's not even an especially important part of who you are, but because of your gender, because of how you're born or how you identify in terms of gender, gender you have duties as a sister, right? to your siblings, you have duties as a daughter to your parents, and you also have duties to your neighbors. And all of the social groups that you navigate through, right? So if you're taking classes, if you're a student, you have duties of reciprocity to your fellow students. You have a relationship with your instructors, with your teachers. So you have a duty as a student to a teacher just as you have duties to your fellow students. And as I mentioned, you, you have duties to your neighbors. If you have other associations, other groups, say you play sports, right? And you're on a team. You know, perfect example in Stoic ethics, right? You have duties incumbent upon you as a teammate, as a member of a team, right? And there's, as Epictetus says, there are always two handles for grasping things. There's the, the, the handle by which you should grasp it, and there's the handle by which you shouldn't. So if you're on a team, the way you shouldn't be a teammate is to be competing against your team members, 
to try to outdo them or grab the spotlight if your team has success, right? That, that, that's not what it is to be a good teammate, right? You've got to be, what do we say? A good team player. And how do you do that? You do that by recognizing this part to whole relationship that Marcus talks about. You are one player on a team of many players. And so how should you identify the good for you? Is it for you to score the most points or to save the most goals or to get the most praise from the coach or something like that? No, you identify your good in terms of the good of the whole team. What's going to be good for the team? Well, sometimes what's good for the team is for you to sit on the bench, for other players to get in and contribute their skills to the game, right? And a good coach will know how to orchestrate the different time that different players are playing, right? Your good is going to be passing the ball or sharing the ball, depending on the sport, with your teammates, passing and shooting in coordination with them, right? Like fingers of the hand. Imagine if the fingers didn't work together, but the thumb was trying to do something very different from the pinky. How would that work, right? For the Stoics, this is the relationship that human beings have to each other, right? We're connected, not as obviously as the hand is, and yet, not as obviously, because of course, you're coming off the same palm, you've got each finger. And so obviously the fingers are connected in the same hand, right? But again, given their cosmological view, their physicalist view, you and I and Simon and Judith are all connected in the human community, like fingers and toes are to the rest of the human body, right? Because it's the same physical scheme. We're all members of the same human body, if you will, of human society. So it might seem like we're separated by thousands of miles, but in fact, our humanity and even more our rationality our ability to communicate and share with each other connects us, uh, undeniably connects us with each other, which is why when we can see in terms of the whole, we can understand the common good. What's good for the team is what each teammate is gonna be able to contribute to it. Thank you so much for that, William. Man, I, I, wanted, I wanted to, uh, keep on pressing you on this, uh, you know, that, that interrelation between spirit and body. Uh, I think I remember hearing this in some sort of new agey Instagram account or something like that, uh, recently. So, um, but I, but it, I, it, it, it stuck in my mind and I kept on thinking about it. The thing was, and, and it might be a kind of Christianized version of what we're talking about here, but that they were kind of saying that, um, we as human beings, we contain the cosmos within our body, as in we are a, a mirror image in the same way that in the Bible it says, you know, we, we are the image made in the image of God. Our body is an image of the cosmos. And the more I thought about this, I started to yeah think, okay, well, um, especially this idea that the Stoics give us that one of the things that makes us different from the animals is our capacity to reason. Or you might even say our capacity to to generate. You know, we can we can take an idea which you might say belongs to the world of spirit. You know, this idea, this thought, uh, and and we can take that and think, okay, how can I make this? It, I hate that this word has been so excuse the bastardized, but 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 how can we manifest? You know, this this idea into physicality into the world, and we as human beings look around us. It's all we're doing all the time. We're constantly taking thoughts, ideas, and we're making them manifest in physicality in the world. And I wonder uh, if if perhaps there's any, um, did, the, did the Stoics, or what, what do you say about this idea that we, as a human body, we encapsulate the entire cosmos, we're a mirror image of the cosmos because we have that reason and the ability to bring it into the flesh? Yes, very good. So, so that that bit of the divine, which all human beings share, is this 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 fiery this fiery spark, right? So the Stoics describe this in terms of the, the architectonic fire, 
or fancy way of saying craftsman like craftsmanship like fire. So basically, the idea is that the orderless orderliness of the universe is the result, is the ongoing process of the divine uh, manifesting its reasoned orderliness in the physical world. So the, the orderliness that we see in the universe is not random. It's not arbitrary. It couldn't possibly be. It reflects an obvious intelligence. Uh, uh, an artificer, one who who crafts things, organizes them, makes them fit together in an appropriate logical kind of way. This is reason. This, this is logos establishing order, right? So this this fiery craftsmanship, this fiery craftsman, right? This this, this heated <laughs> heated logos, this hot reason. This is what's manifested in reason throughout the universe. So it's not just that it's in, in the divine craftsman separate from the world. This reason pervades, this fiery craftsmanship-like orderliness pervades the entire cosmos. And it's particularly localized. It's, it's more densely realized, if you will, in rational beings like us. And so we do mirror that power to create order, to structure things, to craft them following a plan, right? As you were saying, an idea, a blueprint, right? That we grasp with our minds. We can enact that plan through our creative powers. And in that way, we are acting as divine creators. Is a very, I think, is a very significant idea that they have, and it's it's had a lot of historical influence. But but that's really the 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 signature divine power is to create order, not to destroy, not to break apart, but to bring together, to synthesize, to manufacture something that fits a plan, an idea bringing it into reality, have the idea, and then you make it real in the physical world. That, mm. That's the manifestation, right? And so we reflect that. So uh, one, one paper that um, I finished recently that'll be uh, published um, in a volume on environmental ethics in the Midwest um, uh, comments on this idea that the Stoics liked drawing this parallel between divine activity and farming. <laughs> Mm. So you think, well, you know, in society today, we, we don't often think about farming and we might not think that farmers are particularly important. Well, um, when we think more carefully about what they make possible for us, sustenance every day, farming is extremely important to all of us, right? And we ourselves can garden. The parallel that the Stoics draw that um, Musonius Rufus, and, uh, in particular, he, he was a big fan of farming is this divine parallel, right? Well, what's, what's so divine about farming? Well, think about it, right? The farmer takes the field, what nature gives and cultivates it, pulling out the weeds, watering, raising up the crops from the earth to produce food, without which life is impossible, right? right? You gotta eat, right? So in taking, kind of wild nature and cultivating it, right? Making it orderly with the farming implements. The farmer is acting like Zeus, is acting like God, is taking this raw matter of the cosmos and imposing order on it. Mm. And the orderliness is anything but value neutral. Because when you take something and you put it in an order and you, you, and you order it, you structure it, you make it fit together in the right sort of way, it's beautiful. It's a creation of beauty, right? And so when you see a carefully cultivated field, when you see an orchard, right, producing fruit, when you see the crop coming up, right, if you have an appreciation for natural beauty enhanced 
wild nature enhanced by the activity of reason and the creative addition of the farmer's skills to these plants growing, you recognize the beauty of a farm. You see its value, right? You really appreciate what nature has provided and then what is embellished by the farmers adding the labor and the thought and the planning and the care and attention to it. This is a divine activity, creating food. Mm -hmm. It comes from nature, but it's assisted by the farmer, right? And the two are not working opposed to each other, but to the contrary, they're collaborating, they're cooperating. Nature and the farmer with, with her reason are working together to produce this beautiful crop, this product, which mm -hmm. sustains life itself. This is a divine activity. This is a godlike activity. And we can extend this, of course, to other disciplines, right? So when you're writing, when you're when you're uh, at at a at, at the wheel doing some pottery, right, and you're throwing a pot, and you bake it, right, anything that you make, carpentry, obviously, you know, anything that we that we make or create or produce, this is a divine activity. This reflects the divine spark of spirit, reason, the architectonic fire. Um, that the Stoics talk about that pervades the whole universe, but is particularly localized and intensified in this sort of, in these human activities of production. Mm. I love that. And something that's interesting to note, something that popped up into my mind as you're talking about this is even in farming, there's there's more or less harmonious ways of doing farming and, and being in interaction with with the land i mean uh, i have a friend back in australia she uh, studied uh, uh, biology i believe and she was working for a major uh, farming corporation over there and she was dealing with this farmer who was just spraying all of his cops with all these chemicals and uh, crops with all these chemicals and everything and she said to him like if you would just take a quarter of an acre over in this corner of your farm and start growing these types of plants here, all of the bugs would go over into that tiny little portion of your, your farm yep. and leave the rest of it alone so that yep. you don't have to throw all these chemicals everywhere. Um, but that's such a beautiful, totally, you know, somebody growing up on a farm, you know, I, I recognize that it's so beautiful to see this beautiful relationship between us and the land. Well, I, I, maybe I want to ask something related to um, uh, Angie's question earlier. Again, going back to this, there's, you know, spirit matter, but then there's the interaction. A kind of metaphor that I thought about the other day when it relates to fire, I thought it was so appropriate that that fire is this picture of the Logos because you think, what does fire do? It takes material and you see it go up into the air and all of a sudden it's nothing. It just, it takes this material and burns it up until it's just in the ether you know it is that interaction that's exactly what it is um but angie was mentioning earlier you know studying sociology sociology and and how you know breaking humans down into all these different fragments and i wonder if perhaps what's happening in a, in today's world is that whether it is in academia or politics or whatever it is it, we're so focused on fragmentation we're so focused on division of human beings into our parts, perhaps there wouldn't be so much pushback against some, some of these ideas if at the end of all that division, they then said, and here's how it all comes back together. <laughs> right. But do you feel as though uh, what's happening right now is we've just become so obsessed with breaking down into smaller and smaller parts until eventually there's just going to be nothing that we find in common with each other. Right. Yeah. I mean, this, this is very much, this is very much a concern, which we share with, with many others. And, and the pandemic did nothing to help this. The pandemic made this far, far worse because given the challenges of public health, we, we had to separate, right? We had to stay apart during the worst part of, of COVID, the worst period, right? And it's just, I mean, again, from Marcus's point of view, this would be like taking an animal's body and separating its arms from its legs, from its organs and scattering them apart. And, you know, the kind of tenuous communication through Zoom, right? This is, this is a wonderful vehicle that we can communicate this way, but it's not the same thing as, it's very different than 
being in the same space and sharing the, the same kinds of lived experiences where you can smell the same things and see the same things in your micro environment with your friends and family members who you see frequently, then the connection is easy, right? It's when it's someone that you don't interact with on a regular basis that you don't know, you know, the, the, the fear or the worry is, well, how are they gonna react to me if they're a stranger, right? Are they going to speak my language, for example? Are they gonna share my concerns? So is this a potential friend or is this someone that I have to be on guard against because they're, they're gonna be opposed to my interests? This is, this is the kind of you know, nervous fence sitting uh, navigation we have to do when we're, when we're out in public and in an environment in which there might be uh, sources of, of worry or concern or fear or whatnot. So no, the fragmentation that you're talking about, yes, this is this is a serious problem, and and this is what leads to so many uh, uh, mental health problems. People don't feel when they're when they're separated from others, when they don't feel like they belong, when they don't identify themselves as a member of a cohesive group that looks out for each other, sharing the same interests, right? If they don't feel like they're part of a team, if they don't feel embedded in a community of others who are like-minded and supportive and, and have the same kind of worldview and values and, and concerns and interests, right? That's when the fragmentation, that's when alienation is born. That's when alienation drives people apart and we see each other as obstacles or threats to each other's well-being instead of partners, mm -hmm. instead of comrades and allies and companions, right? So yeah, I mean, the, the, the stoic idea there is we, we and, and Marcus repeats this all the time in the meditations, you have to recognize yourself as part of a whole. You are, you are a living organ connected to other human beings, right? You share the same interests. And even if you want to try to break yourself off, you can. I mean, you have the power of reason, you have autonomy, you can make up your own mind, make your own decisions, choose to act in an antisocial way and try to separate yourself from others. But what happens then? Well, what happens is what happened to poor Tom Hanks, right? In the Castaway movie, to be that radically separate from all other people is, is a kind of terrible imprisonment. And, and in fact, the consequence that it has, the effect that it has is to dehumanize us. Human beings, as the ancient Greeks always emphasize, are deeply social and political animals. We are always connected to each other, even when it seems that there's conflict and fragmentation we're always gonna have to come back to the fold and, and interact with each other and find positive ways of community building and cooperation, which is why in the movie, if you know the Tom Hanks movie, right? You know, as a human being, totally isolated on that island, what did he end up inevitably doing? He personified a volleyball. This is Martin Buber's idea of I and thou, mm. right? There's always got to be a dialogue. Human beings are always going to be in dialogue with each other. And even if you isolate, physically isolate one human being with no other human beings around, there's still gonna be a dialogue. Why? Because there's gonna be the voice inside your head. So you have to, you always are gonna have a dialogical partner, even if it's just another part of your mind. And so what the Tom Hanks character did was, yeah, he created Wilson, right? By, by, by you know, random, by accident, he cut his hand, he grabbed the volleyball, he threw it, and it made it look like what? A face. Because human beings psychologically are always looking for patterns. Whenever you see something that looks like a face in, in, in an abstract piece of art, or in a cloud or trees, uh, leaves in a tree or a, a log or something in shape, 
we, we're, we're hardwired, it seems, psychologically to look for something that resembles a human face. Why? Because we're drawn to dialogue with other minds, with other human minds. And if it's got a human face, then we know it's going to have a mentality to it. There's going to be an intelligence there. There will be logos. There will be reason. There will be the ability to share through language. Mm. And so we're going to create that kind of dialogical pairing. And this is why these groups, right? If you're struggling with a mental health problem or you're feeling alienated, you're feeling separate, you feel like you don't belong to any group, you have to seek other people out. And if, and if going online allows you to do that in a fruitful, beneficial way, then more power to, to the internet for doing that. But I, I still, I, I, I've, I guess I'm still a dinosaur in this regard. I'm still old school in holding that it, it, as beneficial as those sorts of, you know, virtual online relationships can be. You don't want those in place of, but rather in addition to lived face-to-face -face contact. This is why, you know, teaching in the classroom for me was always very enjoyable because I'm connecting directly with the students who are in the same room with me and I can read their body language and I can listen to their concerns. I can see, you know, what kind of mood they're in if they're feeling a particular amount of stress. This is extremely hard to do to catch up on all these subtle cues just through a Zoom meeting or on the telephone much less, you know, an email message, right? Mm. All of those emotional tones are just washed away when you're sending emails. But to circle back to your question then, I think making this connection, remembering our dialogical nature, remembering that we're parts of this human society in an organic, connected, interconnected way, this is what we need in order to overcome the fragmentation, the, the sociological, factors, the political factors, forces that are pushing us into separate boxes, right? As Angie was talking about in terms of identity, right? If, if I identify in terms of one or two or three different features of my body, well, that's really very minimizing. That's a very reductionist approach to human identity, to what a human person is. We're very complex. Human persons are very complex. We have lots of different interests, so many different relationships with different groups of people and, and non-people, right? That, you know, you would have to forget all of that to think that you could just be categorized or put into a box in terms of your race or class or gender or wealth or sexual orientation or whatever. That's a very reductionist view. That, mm. that Stoic thinkers would resist, right? Our reason is far more important for establishing commonality and solidarity, right? That's what we want, right? We want to feel connected like we belong in a human community with others who have shared interests. Mm. I, I want to bring uh, Judith in here, but before I do, I just have to mention, you, you're talking about uh, how, you know, solitude takes us away from our interconnectedness, obviously, but it's interesting to note that Seneca, while he was exiled on the island of Corsica, I believe, he was there and, and as he wrote, he literally said, uh, you know, as long as I can track the moon and the stars, you know, he was in dialogue with the universe. Yes. He said, as long yes. as I have these two things, universal reason and my individual virtue, he said, what does it matter which ground I stand on, you know, and just Excellent. blows my mind to think about that. You know, that that's such a profound statement. He's all alone there, you know, exiled. And that's what he says, you know, but Judith, please jump in. Oh, well, Simon, you, you kind of took the words out of my mouth because I was oh. going to make the point that, of course, exile was not to, and that, that's why exile was such a um, a terrible punishment in, in, in ancient Rome. And of course, Misonius Rufus was exiled, Seneca was exiled philosophers and difficult people generally were always getting exiled and they were being cut off from community and that's that's why it was such a um a dire punishment um because it did cut people off from 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 their networks and and that was um it was something that philosophers were particularly liable to suffer um and and, and particularly you know i suppose i mean seneca was obviously coping with it in a in a wonderful way but um so that was exactly 
part of what I was going to say, but I also want to ask you, William, how do you think Stoic, um, Stoic cosmology and theology uh, fits or, or didn't fit with the traditional cults, bearing in mind, of course, that, that Marcus Aurelius and, and Faustina had their own cult and, and were considered divine. How, how, how do you see those um, factors working together or, or not? That's a really good question, Judith. Thank you for that. That's a that's a tough one. So, yeah, I in Marcus's case, it, it's really kind of a head scratcher for me because in the meditations, he he doesn't discuss the individual cults. He he really does have that more view from above, kind of holistic cosmic perspective, and he talks about the divine law. Period. Like not not divine laws, because of course, you know, the empire has lots and lots of different laws. And in terms of cult worship, you know, they're they're polytheists through and through, right? So lots of different gods, lots of different heroes to worship, lots of different customs to to show reverence to those divine entities. So it's just all plural and myriad, right? But that's not the language that Marcus uses in the meditations. It's the divine law. It's the one law, Goss. So again, he 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 always seems to be comfortable with understanding, to use some Platonic language now, the many in terms of the one. It's one cosmos, right? It's a one turning, it's a unit verse. So the one cosmic law that pervades all the many different instantiations of gods, heroes, worship practices, customs, that sort of thing. He sees them as fitting together holistically, right? So the fancy term that I use in my book on Marcus um, in philosophy is called myriology, right? Miros, Greek for part. So the study of parts, and more specifically, or, or, or more completely, the relationship between parts and alls. This is always Marcus's method that he rehearses again and again in the meditations. How do you understand a thing? Break it down into its parts. How do you understand this small thing? See how it connects to all these other small things in the big picture, because there's one big picture with lots of little details in it. So it, in Marcus's case, that seems to be, as far as I can tell, how he manages to combine, maybe even conflate these individual cult worship practices with an orientation toward the whole, W-H-O-L-E, right? Now, in Epictetus's case, he's, ex he's explicitly ambiguous. <laughs> and by that, what I mean is that he interchangeably in the discourses talks about God, Zeus, the God, and the gods, singular plural. Epictetus uses them interchangeably. I, I see no, no consistent hierarchical system in Epictetus's theology at all. He thinks that they're just all of a piece. And so so he has no problem with individual. I mean, he, he'll talk about, you know, visiting the, what is it, the, the, the statue of Zeus uh, that the travelers will go and see because it's just an, this incredible, huge uh, statue. And if you're a tourist, you want to go see it. He says, yes, go see it. You know, absolutely. But don't make the mistake of thinking that that's the God or that the God's power is limited to that temple that that particular statue resides in, this is the consolation that Seneca has, that, that Simon described. Just look up at the sky and you see the sun, the moon and the stars all doing their regular movement, illustrating the divine orderliness of the whole universe. And so this is why for Musonius and, and for those Stoics that were exiled, exile, it's going to be hard for non-Stoics. They are going to miss their, their friends and their associates and their family members. But a Stoic is never, uh, is never desolate, Epictetus argues. There's no such thing as desolation 
for someone who has the stoic understanding that wherever you go in the universe, you're still at home. Your home is the universe. This is the cosmopolis. That's like, well, if I'm here at my home, but I go across the street, am I going to freak out because I'm not at home? Well, I'm still in my hometown. Anywhere I go, I'm going to be in Midland, Michigan, right? For the Stoics, the idea is much bigger than that. Anywhere you go on the surface of the planet, you're at home in Zeus's cosmos. And so that's the reason that Seneca recognizes he's never alone, even if he's in, you know, his body is in exile in Corsica, his mind can travel the cosmos. The God, the divine, the divine voice, divine reason is with him anywhere his body goes in the Mediterranean world. That's a really comforting thought that you're never truly alone. Epictetus describes it slightly differently. He talks about the daimon, the spirit within. He says, even if you're in the dark and you think you're having your own little private thoughts, you're not alone. Your thoughts are known to God, to the divine. And that shouldn't make you feel like you're being spied upon by Big Brother. That should not be an unsettling thought. That should be a deeply comforting thought that you have someone looking out for you. You have someone who's paying attention to what you're thinking and feeling and desiring. There's someone who's always paying attention to you. So you're never neglected. You're never isolated and alone and forlorn and desolate and desperate, right? Recognize that you're always embraced by this divine intent, uh, divine attention, right? That the cosmos, I mean, the basic idea is the cosmos cares about you. You can see how this sort of idea is going to be eaten up with a big spoon by the early Christians, right? That's why they loved Epictetus. They just adored Epictetus because of this spiritualist language that he describes in the discourses, right? You're never alone. You always have this and, and Seneca talks about this too, the monitor, right? He talks about, I, I forget the, the number of the letter, but you, you've got this, this internal you know, spirit monitoring you. And that at the end of each day, you should review you know, how you've behaved. Did, did I say the right things to the right people at the right time? Did I perform the, the noble upright actions? Did I fulfill all of my duties? You know, did, did I act with respect to others? Did I treat myself with respect, with self-respect? This is what something we need to review each day. And we have this little divine monitor, right? Keeping, keeping track of us, paying attention to our thoughts, not just our actions, but our very thoughts and, and dreams and desires. Man, this is such profound stuff. And uh, Willie, I wonder if I can, um, I'm going to, try and pull a few ideas together because uh one of the things that islam and christianity are kind of famous for is uh, going out there and really conquering large portions of the world in order to gather people together under one you might say system of logic you know uh that that'll help people to understand you know the heights and the depths now while i may not uh, uh condone the methods it's all in it's all in the past you know uh but you know you don't necessarily condone the methods but i get the reason why they would have wanted to go out there and as quickly as possible get as many people to see what sure. they saw because sure. in a way what you're giving us today i i see this as no different to to you know jacob's ladder like a ladder to god because it's really this okay here's the fragmented and and the many and the you know the physical and here's the one the wholeness and here's the ladder that we can see that goes between that. And when you can learn how to travel between those worlds, everything becomes so much more profound. Everything makes so much more sense. And what I really, everybody here knows uh, that I have uh, uh, definitely got existential dread about the direction that we're all going in the world right now. And I believe for good reason, because really we, we're obsessed with fragmentation right now. And I, I just can't help but think that what we really need in the world right now 
is for some kind of system like this to be able to imagine if we could go into everybody's home and say, listen, just give me five minutes. I'll explain to you how we are actually interconnected, how we do actually make a whole, I want to go right. out there and prophesy this to be, you know, right. Like, right. please just see this. And I wonder, you know, I, I don't know, maybe you could speak to that. This, you know, this idea that really what, what we need here is, is this, this whole to part relationship defined for everybody so that we're not so obsessed with the, well, maybe, maybe let, let me put it like this, you know, Heraclitus, I can't, I can't stop thinking about this, this little, uh, little poetic bite of wisdom that he had. He said, those who are unmindful when they hear, you know, for all them, yeah, for those who are unmindful when they hear may be likened unto the walking dead, you know, we're so obsessed yeah. with our body, you know, we're so, you know, we think that this is what we are. You, like you said before, we had this reductionist view. Well, I'm a male or I'm, uh, you know, whatever gender you want to be or whatever it is. It's like, I am this little part of myself. Uh, I don't know. Maybe the question is, do you think we can get out of this? <laughs> or do you think in this globalized world where we're just going to keep on fragmenting until, I don't know, war is inevitable everywhere? Wow, that's that's really yeah, that's really tough. And I, I I will I will confess, Simon, that I do I I experience that existential dread too. There's so much bad stuff going on, and and uh, politically there there are plenty of things to worry about. Um, so you really have to dig deep these days, I think, to try to foster some optimism. Um, but I I, I think that. It helps to remember that there that, as I said, that, that that you're not alone. If you're feeling mm -hmm. overwhelmed, if you're feeling in the minority, and and you're being trampled, well, I mean that very well might be the case, but there are always going to be other people out there that are are either going to be allies or they're potential allies, and so what what we have to do is reach out. We have to work at, at that kind of grassroots level, person to person, forging these connections and, you know, interacting with strangers. We, we have to be courageous and talk to people. Talk to, talk to strangers, right? Because I, 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 in my own experience, I find this again and again. If you're, if you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling, you know, uh, if you're feeling unsafe, right, you're you're not alone. There, there are others out there who are having the same sorts of feelings you are. But the mistake is to then withdraw and fall silent. Because then it's like we're, we're, we're sinking into our own little black hole of despair. And if we fall silent, then, then we we are going to feel inevitably we'll feel isolated. So the the uh, as I see it, the only remedy to that is to is to look outward to others, to seek out other people. So if you have a group of friends, if you're a member of a community uh, or social group, reach out to others, talk talk to your fellows, and try to establish connections, networking with other social groups, right? And 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 especially not just even, but especially those who are going to have different views than you are, right? This is why these interfaith dialogues are so important uh, when we're talking about religious differences. But these days, it's the political divides which are just being ramped up and amplified, and and have become so savage and violent, right? You know. You, you know, in the United States, as we know, you know, the January 6th insurrection was just absolutely horrible. And we see these images and they frighten us and they anger us. And this seems like this is such an act of injustice. But now wait a second, right? If we're feeling intimidated by this, if we're feeling frightened by this, right, or even outraged by this, Let's stop for a minute, step back, and try to look at things from Marcus's cosmic perspective. How many people were involved in the insurrection? A few hundred. 
How many Americans are concerned about the future of the United States and democracy? Never mind worldwide, just in the United States. Hundreds of millions of people. This is a tiny, tiny fragment of violent people who made very bad decisions because they've been brainwashed by Fox News. They've bought into the propaganda and they have very dangerous, bad ideas. But it's a tiny sliver of the population of law abiding American citizens who care about their families, who care about their communities, and who are patriots, real patriots, who want the good things for the United States. And you can't love the United States if you don't love Americans. This is the thing in the political diatribe that people talk about, oh, this group is dangerous, this group is bad. And then they, they wrap themselves in the flag and they say, we're patriots, we love America, right? Let's make America great again. You can't love America unless you love Americans. These are human beings who have different religious views than you, different political views than you, different backgrounds, right? Different ethnicities, different sexual orientation, different gender, different race, right? There are these differences, right? But if you're gonna love America, you have to love Americans. These are real red-blooded human beings you have to love. And that's the connection. Not identifying yourself in terms of a political party or even a national identity, right? But in terms of your humanity, which is shared, shared humanity, shared interest in living in a safe community with a good job and good health care and good education to pursue happiness, right? Which, as the Stokes remind us, is impossible without virtue. So you've got to be a good citizen and you've got to be a good person in order to be a happy person. So how do you do that? How do you cultivate that? You seek out other good people. You find the good in other people. You don't think of people in terms of enemies. They're different from me. They're hostile. They're a threat. No, that's a fellow human being. That's one finger recognizing another finger as a finger. Same hand, same body, same human cosmopolis, right? Same humanity. You have to find that common humanity in other people. And, and yeah, there are gonna be differences and those differences are okay, right? Again, let's go back to the hand example. If I had five thumbs, my hand wouldn't work nearly as well, right? You don't have five thumbs. So there is gonna be some differences, right? But those differences, the Stoics thing, are orchestrated in such a way that it's a symphony. They're not all violins. They're not all trombones, right? You've got lots of different instruments that together make this tremendous, fantastic symphonic music, right? That's music when you've got mm -hmm. the different notes, not all the same. Just like you're saying with the farming, right? Monoculture, bad. Dumping lots of chemicals, bad. You want polyculture, different crops that that you know respond to the different insects, right? Again, diversity is good. Within, mm. so it's not it's not a monolith, right? This kind of monism that the Stoics have. You've got diversity. You've got heterogeneity inside this cosmic unity. They're not mm. at odds. So looking to that, I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not a wise man. I don't have a solution to these deep political problems, the, the discords that we have. But it seems to me that connecting at the human level, not thinking, oh, well, our political leaders are going to take care of everything. No, that's to give up. That's not to take your citizenship seriously. We each have to do our part, right? Mm. Working together at the human level small groups building up to grassroots movements we're going to have we're going to have the government and the society that we deserve ultimately mm. it seems to me that that's the kind of you know tough love truth i think right mm. if if we want a more harmonious society we've got to work for it hard mm.
we, we've got to shoulder our, our share of that burden. We can't hope that someone else is gonna create that for us. We've gotta make it for ourselves, working together. No one person, I don't have any power. What am I gonna do? I'm just one person. Well, you know, if you look at history, history is a series of stories about individual persons that learned how to pull together groups to achieve great things. They were, they were real leaders, they were real visionaries. So you've got to keep the vision, you've got to keep the faith and, and seek out collaborators, seek out comrades and coworkers, teammates, right? Who want to pitch in and achieve the same good things that you do. And they're going to want the same good things. People don't want radically different view, you know, people don't have radically different views of what the basic essentials of good life are. I think we all agree on that. It's how do we get that for everybody? How do we share that equitably? That's that's the challenge that we face. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's so important that you're mentioning this. And even, you know, perhaps uh, before I bring Angie in, because I believe Angie had a question, but um, I'll, 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 you know, reach an olive branch out to uh, people who might uh, lean more to the right. I mean, um, one thing that I found so interesting, <laughs> I actually got a one-star review on the podcast once, and the reason that they gave for it was they said, this guy's clearly a lefty. And <laughs> <laughs> and and that is so funny because I really do not feel like I identify to the left or to the right. But seeing Biden's speech recently, you know, what it, you just mentioned, okay, there's like a few hundred people there that day, right? But what did Biden do recently? MAGA Republicans are our biggest enemy right now. You know, are you serious? Yeah. Make America great again. Actually, it's kind of a positive message if you think about it. I mean, we want to make this country strong. Well, and and not all MAGA Republicans would have agreed with that. I know that, you know. And so I, yeah. I think that a lot of people who listen to this podcast will probably find themselves in, in my position and probably a lot of us here where it's not about left or right. It's it's about, you know, these individual choices that we're making on both sides that are, that continue to lead us to to this fragmentation. Uh, but Angie, I want to bring you in because this is this is right up your alley in terms of local politics and everything like that. So, yeah, I was just thinking, like, um, you know, you're you're saying that we should all come together, but I think we should just go back to the basics. Like, how will we come back together? Like, we don't. I think the pandemic and the isolation really made us um, forget how to socialize in a proper, appropriate way. I yeah. mean, I, I work with children and although they, um, they're, um, they might have disabilities, but a lot of what I'm trying to teach them is like, okay, what is the appropriate manner in, in, in to act? Like, how do you make a friend? Like, let's practice how to speak to a friend or how to, um, or just saying like, hello and goodbye, looking people in the eye when you're talking to them or, um, you know, like basic social skills. And I think, I don't know, like even like typical kids, they lack this, you know, and it's because nobody's really teaching them how to socialize, like what's the proper right. way to socialize. And yeah. um, your emotions are are incredibly valid when you're upset or frustrated. But is it like I, I use this a lot with my kiddos where just like, oh, well, was that a big deal or was that a little deal? Because you're up here and you should be like right here, like. You know, you need to like, it's OK that you're upset, but we need to know what what what's actually appropriate, um, an appropriate way to respond to it. And uh, I think that's also like why I like stoicism, because it is about appropriately connecting with others. Yeah, um, that's really that's really good. Thank you. Angie. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, yeah, it, it's about education is vital. How, how, how do we learn what we need to learn? How do we become good people? How do we come, become good, well-rounded people? It's education. And this is why for Stoics, education, educators are the, it, it's the most noble profession there is. All of these Stoics were teaching students who passed on their wisdom to the next generation of students. And so that's why what you do 
is so very important. What teachers at all levels of education do is so very important. And as a retired professor myself, I cringe when I see in the news these stories about teachers that are being abused by these, these parent groups and they're being shouted at these PTA meetings and, and, and uh, uh, Board of Education meetings, people running for office and, and the, just the hateful language, the, the book banning. I mean, this is, this is just, I thought we were past this centuries ago myself. So for this, for book banning, right, to, to ban books so that people can't even read them is just total anathema. This is poison for the educational goals, as I see it, of, of, of people everywhere at all levels. So, I mean, part of it, I mean, Robert Reich, for example, he thinks that the solution is pretty straightforward when it comes to what teachers need. They need to not have to buy school supplies from their own wallet, paying for their own students' school supplies themselves. This is how dedicated they are. What's the solution that Reich recommends? Robert Reich recommends doubling the salary of all teachers, period. Double their salaries. They're all horribly underpaid. We need to value our teachers. We need to support them. We need to thank them and praise them for dedicating their lives to the formation of our children and the next generation, right? This is absolutely vital. I mean, I can't argue with that. Double the salaries of all teachers at all levels. Okay, preschool, kindergarten, through elementary school, high school. Professors don't need to have their salaries doubled, but pre-college <laughs> instructors do. Absolutely. And so talk about noble professions. Yeah, farming. Yeah, teachers too. Absolutely. And I sometimes, you know, the, the, the rhetoric that we hear often, like when you're going to, I don't know, a sporting event, a baseball game or something like that, the announcers will say, well, you know, let's, let's express our appreciation for first responders and those serving in the military, right? Firefighters and paramedics and, and soldiers and police officers. Yes, yes, I, I'm, I'm absolutely in support of all of that. But let's not stop there. Let's also turn to our fellow fans and thank all of the teachers who were there, right? Like, like first responders have a more important job than teachers? No way, no way, let's thank the teachers. But we don't hear that very often, do we? in our public discourse and the announcers at baseball games and sporting events, they don't say, yeah, let's give a discount for educators. Now, some, some companies do this, to be fair, some companies do give discounts for, you know, if you're an educator and you're buying a book or something like that, some few do that. But society-wide, we don't have this kind of admiration for teachers that they richly, richly deserve, right? And what's the explanation for that? Well, the Stokes are going to say, it's ignorance. Plain and simple, people forget. So yes, absolutely. No, I, I, I think the role of teachers, mentors, role models, and, and parents, but, but also you know, non-parents who have that kind of fiduciary relationship like mentors do, teachers do extremely important to teach to teach kids the socialization absolutely because they're they can learn it they're human they they're reasonable they they have reason they can learn it but they have to be taught it and and the pandemic is just you know thrown the pandemic through real wrench in that by that social isolation so again if we can meet together teachers and students in person show them how to speak using eye contact listening more than you speak, right? There's a, Simon, you, you must know this old saying, right? There's a reason why we have one mouth, but two ears, mm. right? It's so that we listen twice as much as we speak. 
this is something really hard for me because I'm a blowhard professor, right? I'm used to <laughs> spouting on for hours at a time. But it can be learned. We can improve, right? We can learn. Listening is a skill. Listening is, a, it's not just a perceptual ability, it's a skill. So learning how to listen to people, learning how to pay attention to what their concerns are before you respond, before you say, oh, okay, I think I understand what you're saying. Are you saying this? And then you repeat it back to them to make sure that you're interpreting them accurately, right? And letting them voice their concerns. This is very important. So yeah, being very good listeners. This is a way of building cohesion, listening, mm. patiently listening to other people to understand where they're coming from. And it also has other benefits, of course. It dispels any sort of prejudices you might have or assumptions faulty assumptions that you might have about what their concerns are. You might assume that they have this concern or they're coming from this angle or this is what their, their uh, grievance is or whatever. Well, no, instead of assuming that, ask them. Let them mm. voice it and then make sure that you're listening closely. Then you can understand where they're coming from. This is one of my favorite quotations from Epictetus where he says, well, you want to know why somebody's acting the way they are and you're you're totally perplexed why someone could possibly act that way? Get to know their judgments. What is their motive, right? People don't just behave erratically, randomly, even if they do things that are unimaginable to us. There's a reason they're doing what they're doing. They have thought through why they believe that acting in this way is the correct way to act. We certainly don't have to agree if they're doing something violent or harmful or hostile toward others. We're not going to agree with their behavior and, 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 the, and we're not going to agree that they're justified in doing with what they're doing. But if we ask them and find out what it is that's motivating them, then we can understand. And if we can understand them, then we can work toward trying to connect with them and identify with their concerns mm. and give them help, you know, the, the kind of education, the correction, right? The good ideas that we can share with them. If we can understand them, then we can do that. But if we see them as just aliens, as just, you know, threats doing terrible things and acting like crazy people, there's no way we're going to be able to connect because we can't get that understanding. Finding that common ground that that's what's absolutely vital for mm. building community, I think. Judith, I want to bring you in, but do you mind if I just say one quick thing before I do? Is uh, I think I think the the whole uh, you know teacher board uh, big debate that's going on right now is actually a perfect uh, place to to go into the weeds about what you're saying there. If we can just listen to both sides, then we'll see. Because I think that what you said is exactly right, and and it's very. I, I think it's the the CNN version of what's happening, which is that hey, there's all these angry Republicans out there yelling at these teachers, telling them that they know better. And sure, none of us want these people coming in there and screaming at teachers. But I also just listened to a video the other day. This 12 year old who stood up in a uh, in a teacher board meeting, and what he was saying is, on my first day of school at this school, the lesson that we were being taught was basically that everybody who was not white was <laughs> deserved all of this and they were oppressed and everything. And if you're white in here, then you're the oppressor. And here's this little white kid, this 12 year old who just wants to do what, and what he, what he said is I'm now going to a private Christian education and I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to do great things. And it's not going to be because of this school. And I thought, good on you, this 12 year old standing up and saying, you know what, like the less you're indoctrinating me to your ideology and it's actually dividing me from my classmates. And so I think if we all just listen to both sides, we would see, okay, yeah, we want our teachers getting paid more. Okay, great. We want great teachers. Like this is why the Stoics, I think, are such great connectors because they say it's not about being a teacher. It's about being a good teacher. You know, you want to strive to be a virtuous teacher. And perhaps if more virtuous teachers got paid better, that would be excellent for everybody, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think the, the the great connection here is that we don't want teachers indoctrinating our kids with terrible ideas that are dividing us. And we also don't want our teachers to be underpaid, overworked, buying things for their kids. We can come together on this issue. But you've got Fox News saying it's 
you know, <laughs> giving us all the best examples of the Republicans. And then you've got CNN giving us the worst examples of the Republicans, these things. And it's just, it's just tearing us apart right. when there's so much unity in the center there. Uh, but I don't know, Judith, I think you raised your hand at around the same point that we were talking about this. And uh, look, I'm, my point is is right back at the cosmic level, okay? Yeah, good, good, um, good. So, and I, I guess to, it's to William, um, because we're coming from, I guess, what you might call the broader stoic community, we, we've got no problem in talking about a, an orderly cosmos. In fact, you know, that's that's kind of what we um, what we accept. But how do you feel, William, about, you know, as a philosopher among other philosophers, many of whom are, um, might be kind of quite, um, quite, prominently atheist or whatever do you, do you feel comfortable talking about um cosmic order when when you're in non-stoic settings oh uh <laughs> not so settings um yeah i mean i in a i, I say this only partly tongue-in-cheek i mean uh, over the course of my career um i've given you know dozens and dozens of different talks i've presented papers at lots of different kinds of conferences and conventions. Um, and I, I could say, I can report honestly that uh, really the only time that I felt like uh, I, I was in a particularly friendly and welcoming, um, a, a, a stoic friendly environment were the two stoicons that I participated in. <laughs> so this is Makes two out of dozens and dozens and dozens of conferences and conventions because, you know, more routinely, you know, I'm I'm in venues where I'm presenting to audiences that are are not full of, you know, stoic sympathetic people. To the contrary, they they have they are often not not all, you know, some of them are amenable, but but, you know, certainly the outspoken ones more often, the outspoken ones tend to be critical and even positively hostile to stoic ideas that that I'm presenting in in giving these in these papers and in fact online I've uh some years ago so a few years ago I had an interesting exchange with several other uh stoics in the online community about this very question about whether contemporary stoics following Lawrence Becker would in fact be led inevitably by their reason and the advance of science to abandon um, any sort of uh, theological outlook um, and instead construe the world order as ordered by physical laws, sure, but utterly devoid of providence, right? So this is the kind of hard-nosed atheist perspective that there just ain't such a thing as divine providence. Things don't turn out for the best, even at the cosmic level, right? Even Stoics who do believe in providence will admit that if you have a grisly car accident and your, your leg is shorn off, sure, that's going to be, you know, bad at a microscopic level for you in terms of your physical disability that you'll then have to live with the rest of your life. But at the cosmic level, physical laws are in place such that the universe as a whole is still a good place. And so cosmically, um, you know, even though hurricanes, Hurricane Ian rips through Florida, it, you know, that's not a bad thing at the cosmic level because Earth has oceans and human beings, and the planet is undergoing global climate change because of human activity, and also changes climate-wise on its own if it weren't for us. And so there's going to be warm oceans, and sometimes there'll be storms. And this is a bad thing. Um, so these natural laws are a good thing because it's structured in the sort of way that yields ultimately a good cosmic hole. Well, that doesn't do you any that's going to be pretty cold comfort for someone who's just had a car accident or or more to the point with my example, someone at uh, Fort Myers Beach whose whole community has just been obliterated and they haven't had any electricity for a week or the people who live on those islands whose bridges are now destroyed and they can't get off the islands or to the islands if they're up. So, yeah, from that providential. Experience. So anyway, we, we, we've we had I, I've participated in some really nice discussions about whether a contemporary Stoic would, 
you know, be, you know, compelled to, to give up on this notion of divine providence or whether one can credibly defend a philosophical view that the universe does have a kind of providential um, order to it and that we can understand even at the cosmic level events as happening for the good of the whole, however we're to parse that and analyze that understanding. Um, so uh, for me, as a philosopher who's mixed it up with students in the classroom and my fellow colleagues in, in, in the philosophy department at Creighton, who most of whom were very anti-Stoic, by the way, uh, several of many of them were Marxists. So they found Stoicism to be very, very um, uh, unappealing, unattractive. Um, still happy to have conversations, to have had conversations with them and to have these online debates with others who've studied Stoicism. All of this just underscores to me the value of the dialogue. This is how we get at the truth, what we're doing right now, having conversation. And this is why I want to, again, express my gratitude to Simon for making this possible, for providing a venue, uh, a place where we can have these sorts of discussions and learn from each other and ask tough questions and wrestle with you know, possible answers and responses so that we can each grow in our own understanding and gain every little inch of wisdom we can through these conversations. Because I, this is what's made being uh, an educator for me so enriching, so fulfilling for decades. And I tell my students this, you know, in the classroom all the time. I said, I learn from you guys. I learn from you. I mean, sure, my role in the classroom is to be the teacher, the professor, and you're the students learning and writing stuff down. But the way to learn is through dialogue, right? I'm not just passing to you these little nuggets, which you then put in a box and have little bricks that you build up this big wall and then you say, okay, now give me my college degree. It's conversation in the end, it's discussion. This is where the learning happens. When we're talking with each other, when we're responding to each other. And so again, this is why seeking out conversation is so valuable, it's so healing. It, this is where edification, this is where intellectual growth and personal growth comes from is these conversations. So if there's pushback, if there's criticism, bring it on. The Stoics have always faced that through their whole history. And, and, and scholars of ancient Stoicism often reflect that part of the reason, uh, the big part of the reason that Stoicism became such an influential school of thought, such an influential, influential um, movement uh, and philosophy over, this, over the centuries after, as it developed, was because they were challenged by the toughest minded thinkers of antiquity, and they were called skeptics. The ancient skeptical, it wasn't a school, but the ancient skeptical movement of the Pyrrhonists and the academic skeptics challenged Stoic physics, epistemology, logic, and ethics at every turn. And so the ancient Stoics had no choice but to respond to these skeptical criticisms, many of which were, most of which were very powerful very well thought through, couldn't just dismiss them, right? Responding to those criticisms was vital for the Stoics to improve their philosophy, to rethink their doctrines, to make them better and stronger and more sophisticated. So they have a real debt. The ancient Stoics have had that debt to the ancient skeptics from the beginning. What? Why would it be any different now? Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why we should welcome. That's why we should welcome challenges and questions and criticism, even criticisms, counter arguments from those that we're in dialogue with. People are not always going to agree with us. And that's a good thing, because 
if two people are in disagreement, then at most one of them is correct. And what you might find out is sometimes you're in the wrong, that your own thinking can be improved, but it'll only be improved if you're willing to listen to people who challenge you. So you have to be open to that, that, that challenge. And so that's why, yeah, the question and answer period is always the best part, not just reading my paper, but people saying, okay, bring on the criticisms, let's go. And then I roll up my sleeves and we're ready to go. And I've, I've learned so much from that kind of feedback, that input in all sorts of different venues. But I also had a great time at the Stoicon. Don't, don't, don't think for a second that I didn't find that to be a wonderful experience. That was terrific. I, I think what you're saying there is so, so beautiful, William, because I think it really relates to this idea that really, if you see the whole part relationship, then everything that comes in your view is put to good use. Everything can be used for good. Because even if it's a challenge, it's going to challenge you to rise above that challenge and to to meet the new standard. And I think that we're living in a time where it's so unbelievably uh, complex. You know, we're just being inundated every day with complexity. I said this to uh, the parent of a, a new kid who was uh, going to be getting piano lessons at the school I'm now managing here in, in Southern California. And she, her kid was really so creative and and really playing some beautiful stuff on the piano. I said, it makes sense. Excellence is going to get younger and younger and younger and younger as we keep on going because kids are now faced with so much complexity. They have to rise and evolve to the challenge. But, um, you know, William, I, I'm going to be respectful of your time. We should wrap it up here, but I just want to give you some praise as well. You thanked me. I'd like to thank you. I, I really genuinely believe that you are one of the the great Stoic philosophers of our time. The fact that we're, you know, I, this has been such a profound conversation. And I want, I want to share with you one of the reasons why I call the, the, the society, the, the walled garden philosophical society. It's because a walled garden, there's two definitions that I like to use as a walled garden. One of them is a walled garden is a perfect balance between chaos and order. It's a perfect balance between nature and culture because you've nice. got the walls, which is culture, and you've got these pruned uh, uh, plants. So that's culture. But then nature is the chaos of the garden. Yeah, but it's not a garden if it's a rainforest, right? Um, another way to think about it is nice. a place where chaos can manifest itself creatively. And that's what these conversations are all about. This is this is the first uh, uh, iteration of what will be many conversations where we're inviting others to join the interviews, not just me. And what I want is a, this to be a safe place where people can feel, I am going to have courage. I'm going to ask questions of these great scholars or leaders, and I can join the conversation now and have fun learning in dialogue. So uh, I'm really honored by this. I will tell you later on today, I'm going on uh, Brandon's podcast, The Strong Stoic, and he wanted to talk with me about, let's see if we can wrestle with what are some of the great challenges of our time or the great challenges of our time. I think this conversation has been perfect for prepping my mind for that conversation. And I want to thank you, William. Uh, I want to have many more of these conversations with you in the World Garden because it's an honor to be around somebody like you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. That's just wonderful. You're, 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 too, you're too complimentary. Uh, I, I would I would be much more comfortable again emphasizing, hey, I'm just trying to figure things out too. So I'm like yes. everyone everyone else here, right? Not not some uh, uh, you know unapproachable I don't know guru or something. No, I'm I'm down here on the ground trying to figure out the same challenges. But I I really do like your point about how how I, one way to put it is that nothing in the Stoic view nothing is superfluous in nature. No one and nothing is superfluous. So this is why the image of the ecosystem is so powerful in Stoicism. And this is my last thought I would, I, I would offer. This is why the Stoics define the formula of the happy life as living in agreement with nature. Because in nature, when you have these ecosystems, when you have these wild areas of millions of different plant, insect, and animal species, none of it is superfluous. There is no superfluous species, no superfluous plant or insect or animal or reptile or fish. All of it works together. And that's the kind of shared cooperation that, that we want to strive for in our human dealings with each other. So again, yes, thank you very much. That, that this, has been, this has been very enjoyable for me. Did, 
David, did you want to, was there anything you wanted to contribute? Or did you want to add a comment? Well, thank you. No, just to say thank you for your thoughts. <laughs> oh, okay. Very good. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Simon. This is, this is a treat. Look forward to doing it again in the future. Absolutely. I'm going to be in contact with you over the next couple of days. We'll talk about when we can have another one because I'm good. excited for a round two. It's going to be Very great. Good. Thank Thanks you so much, everybody, for showing up. Thank you again, William. And uh, and I'll, I'll talk to you guys very soon. Okay, so there you have it. My conversation with, sorry, our conversation with Professor William O. Stevens. Again, I just wanted to remind you guys that if you want to come along to any of those events coming up in the next few weeks uh, or just this week in the World Garden, including on prayer and presence with Brian Russell or on fame, philosophy and pedigrees with Judith Stove and myself in Soul Searching with Seneca, you can go to thewalledgarden.com forward slash events and you can find the events there and register. We'd love to see you and we'd love to get you involved in these conversations just like you heard today with Professor William O. Stevens and uh, some of our contributors and members of the Walled Garden Philosophical Society. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I hope it's been meaningful to you. It was certainly uh, one of the most profound conversations I've ever engaged in. And uh, I really believe that it's going to be a vital conversation as a marker uh, for what we would like to do in the Walled Garden Philosophical Society going forward. We want to help people to find the kind of peace that can come when you can realize that, that totality, that wholeness, that oneness, even within this hyper-fragmented world that we're living in. And so, uh, once again, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Walled Garden Podcast. Remember that this show is a part of the podcast network of The Walled Garden Philosophical Society. If you consider yourself to be a seeker of understanding, of wisdom, a cultivator of virtue, then we want to learn and grow with you. Just head over to thewalledgarden.com to find out more. We'll see you there, and I'll talk to you in the next episode.